I really want to go to that one, so <laughs> So, um, so we wrap this up with what next? Uh, talked about this a few times. Um, sort of danced around a bit. Um, unlike other technologies, uh, flow geometry is laggy behind in some respects. So if you went out to the web today and tried to find some microdata data, you would find gobs. If you went to find sequence data, you would find gobs. If you want to try and find microarray data, you wouldn't find so much. You might find 58 or so data sets out there uh, that are publicly available. Um, why is that? Lots of different reasons. Um, why could that be important? Um, there was a paper published uh, late last year where somebody went out and mined all this microarray data and uh, just got stuff out of the different data sets that were out there on the web um, and actually found a perfectly selected drug target um, based on the fact that this is low, there's a signal in all these different microarray experiments, but it was like down on the list. No, it wasn't the top hit. It was down like five or six or 12 down on every different list he was looking at um, for this one particular disease. But it was in this experiment, and this experiment, and this experiment, and this experiment, and this experiment. All these publicly available data sets. And it was in the only one that was sort of common across all of them, but people were missing that because they were just doing one at a time. And so he was able to put all this data together find something. Um, they did some also cool stuff, like he didn't actually do any experiments himself. He shipped all, all the MELS models out to get done by somebody else. Didn't actually have to do any kind of it's a computational kind of experiment. We didn't have a wet lab. So he just says, oh, make me a MELS model, do this and do that. Um, end up getting a really good drug target and got a great paper and a, hopefully a drug for a rare disease. But only because all this data was out there for microarrays. And you can't do that right now for flow geometry. Um, even though we've been around for 30 or something more years. Um, so why is it important that we share? Because it allows people to re-explore data sets, um, let you try new hypotheses. Um, now that we know how to do automated analysis, we can go out and mine that data and do extra experiments on that. Um, you have to do that by, um, it's required by many funding journals, um, also by fun funders, and also because we're Canadian and we think it's important to share. So if you're gonna share data with somebody else, um, what do you wanna share? Well, you can't just give somebody bunch of FCS files, and we've talked about this before, uh, getting back to the point of annotating data is so important when doing high throughput experiments. If you talked to Nikesh, um, the guy who is from Gary Nolan's lab and they um, wrote Cytobank, he will tell you the exact same thing. That his number one problem that he's having with the people who are working with Cytobank and trying to deposit their data from large studies is getting people to annotate their data so they can go back and analyze it later. And this is going to be fundamental to anything you're trying to do with high throughput studies especially when you're trying to do computational kinds of analysis. So if you want to annotate your data, um, what kind of stuff do you have to say about that data so you can go back and understand it later? A bunch of people got together. I was one of them. Um, and we came up with something called the Minimum Information about a Full Astrometry Experiment. Uh, sort of following along was done with microarrays um, years before with Miami. And so if you're putting paper into many journals, um, they will say you have to annotate according to the Miami standard. Um, same kind of idea for the, uh, my flow site standard. And it's basically try to get a consensus of um, if you're going to describe a flow geometry experiment, what do you have to describe? We're not trying to tell you um, where to put that information. We're not telling you how to encode that, what file format you're going to put it in. Um, could be in the supplementary material, could be in the methods, could be in the results. Just somewhere you have to say some things about that experiment. This is what people think um, you should write down. Learned experts in the field. There's a Lots of people on this paper who got together and finally agreed on this stuff. And most of that stuff kind of makes sense. Um, if you're writing a paper or something, you kind of want to describe what your variables are, when you did the experiment, um, who did that experiment, how did you treat your samples, um, where did they come from if you went out and doing like a water sample kind of experiment. Um, uh, you probably want to share the FCS data files, or at least a representative sample, so somebody can actually understand that. Um, there can be problems if you look at a paper and you, you see something. It's like, well, how did they get there? And it's difficult to know unless people share that data. Um, you, probably, you probably want to know at least the make and model of the instrument that was run on. You don't have to give the full description of the whole instrument, but at least that would be useful to put somewhere in the description of um, your study. So how can you share your data? This is a little soapbox I'm on. 
Um, flow repository is one way um, that I know about. I, there's no other real public easy way to do that. Sutter Bank is more for um, sharing data within groups. Um, but as far as I know, this is the only way to publicly sh easily publicly share your data that's already something existing out there. Um, it's a database that was funded by the Tri Society, so that's International Society for Advancement for Cytometry, the European Society for EC -ESCA, European Society for Clinical Cytometry Association, and ICCS, the International Clinical Cytometry Society. Um, and they all support that and say that this is a good idea. So what is it? It's a way to share publicly um, your flow structure data sets. It's primarily if you're doing a publication, um, but it doesn't have to be if you just have a bunch of data you want to share. Um, we created it by extending Cytobank. Um, so it's a fantastic platform for doing data analysis. Um, it's free, Cytobank is free to use, um, and you can really great for using within uh, a group of people to share data. Not so great for sharing data with uh, outside of the world. Um, and doesn't do such a good job of annotating as we've done. We basically took that set of back platform, they came, gave it to us as open source, and we added on the MyFlow site components. It's free in two cents. Um, one, it's free in two cents. It's one is a sense of beer. It doesn't cost anything to go grab all the source code, download it, and use it within your own lab. It's also free in the sense of freedom. You can do with the code whatever you want. Uh, it's hosted at Carnegie Mellon University. So if you want to use that, um, you can just go to floorrepository.org right now on your computer and browse all the the data sets out there. Um, but if you want to upload, you have to have an account, and you can use a Google account or Yahoo ID account. Um, there's a really good description in current protocols and cytometry um, that's a free publication on how to use it um, that goes through excruciating detail, the step by step process for doing different kinds of things. Um, this is what it looks like when you get in there. Um, you can browse public data sets. Um, you can see there's a start guide, there's information down here on how to use it. Um, in order to do that, um, really just only a few simple steps. You create a new experiment, click upload your data, you create some annotation templates, and then it gets kind of painful at this point because the first time it sucks because there is some stuff you have to write down in it. And this is why um, when you're doing high throughput experiments, this is the most difficult part is because annotation is hard. It takes time and it's not what you want to do. You just want to get your sample in there, get it analyzed, and get your paper published. The problem comes when you try and trace back, you know, six months later, what actually happened. And this is what we see again and again and again when we're doing, we're doing computational analysis of large data sets, is the people who are doing the analysis on the flow machine are thinking about getting out for coffee. And they're thinking about going home at the end of the day. And they're not thinking about what happens two months down the road when somebody else is here and they're trying to analyze this data in an automated fashion. So taking the time to describe your examples and example sources, taking time to describe your experimental variables, Taking time to describe your similar settings takes time and it's pain. Uh, but we, we try to make this as simple as possible by having Excel spreadsheets. Once again, yay for Excel. Um, because it's a really easy way to do lots of annotations. You copy, paste, and drop down and make these annotation templates to make it really easy to do lots of annotation at once. Um, you can also provide your analysis details. You can upload, for example, Flojo workspaces or stuff from Diva. And then you get the score um, based on how good you've done. Um, we try to be intelligent, so if you upload a bunch of FCS files, we can extract information outside, out from the FCS data files that, to help populate the annotation. Um, you get your My Flow Site score up here. Um, the reason we do this is because then people want to get that score higher because they don't. People stop once it gets over 50% for some reason. Um, they feel like that they passed. We're just making, we're just making, the, we're just making how the score works up, and then people say, "Oh, that's fine. I got over 50." But if we didn't have that, people kind of just do minimal annotation until this is like thing saying you kind of suck because you didn't get about 50. Um, you can de-identify data. So if we're working on clinical data, um, before it uploads, it takes away all the patient identifiers. Um, so that doesn't get uploaded because that's important um, for both HIPAA in the States and generally here in terms of IRB approval. Um, we, do, we know how to do that because we wrote the FCS standard and we know all the keywords out there. Um, that usually get used based on dozens of instruments from lots of different vendors. And so we know what's safe to remove versus what's not, and we just strip out everything that doesn't belong there. Um, once you get, stuff gets uploaded, you can see um, stuff that's checked off is there. What, if it's X'd, it's not there, and you say, well, maybe I can go click on that and hit the improve to see what's actually missing. 
You can also do your data analysis. So this is based on um, stuff that comes out of Gary Norman's lab. Um, so they use this a lot for doing uh, Cytoff analysis. The spade part isn't in here, uh, but everything else is in there. It's not Flojo, but you can do, um, if you're not an expert in R, which you all are now, um, you can do stuff like manually get your data. Um, and then once, once you want to share your data with everybody else, um, you can uh, make it public. Or you can share it in terms of review with reviewers. That gives you a, gives the reviewers a secret code that they can only then view when your paper gets published. Um, if you're working with the right publishers, the publisher will let us know. If you're not, you will let us know, and um, we can unlock that data for the rest of the world. Um, so this is what it looks like today. Um, we have data. We have 68 data, different data sets, I guess, from different publications out there from people around the world. Um, this is just by time, so you see most of the stuff in my lab when we're just starting out, but this goes on and on and on, on now from uh, different labs. I think it's a really cool thing, and since um, it's my workshop, I can talk about it. And, but but sharing is important and annotation is important, and so this gives you one way to do both. Um, next thing that's important is visualization. So this is what it looks like when you're analyzing lots of data with lots of markers. It's really hard. You can't do this. This is, a, this is from the Bendel's paper we're doing CITOF. Um, and so one of the problems that we have when we're doing computational analysis is how do we see what we've just done on the computer? And so we get a lot of p-values. Um, we, we get, you know, we're trying to visualize all this data. How do we do that? Um, it's a bit of an unsolved problem right now um, that pe some people have worked on. Uh, some examples of things that people have done is, is looking at large data sets. Is the spade is one approach. Archaeoptimix is another. I'm not really aware of any other ways to visualize large amounts of flow structure data. There's really only two out there that I'm, that I'm aware of. Um, otherwise, we're stuck, 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 bleh, stuck looking at stuff like this, and this doesn't really scare well to the kinds of analysis you guys are going to be doing now that you're experts in R and doing high throughput data analysis. Um, bit of an unsolved problem, but you know, you know at least how to do one tool, um, and you can go look at spade, spades in R. And so you can learn how to, you can, now that you're our experts, you can go get the Spade uh, library and play with that as well. Um, they also have a nice um, Cytoscape plugin as well that makes it a bit easier to use. Uh, but like I said, you're experts now, you're not afraid of that, and you can use it in R as well. Um, I'm going to walk you through an example here that sort of illustrates the kind of crap, just to give you some idea, that, now that you're experts, on the things that can go wrong when you're doing data analysis. This is an example from my own lab and the problems that we have with visualization and how we kind of walked through um, one example where we, we tried lots of different things. And this is sort of give you ideas um, that it's not always easy and some of the solutions that we kind of play with along the ways um, without showing all the code behind there, but just kind of getting your head that, you know, there's other options out there for doing the kinds of things that we spend a lot of time doing in excruciating detail today. Um, so for this one example, we're trying to find, um, look at MRD, minimal residual disease in um, type of leukemia, and the hypothesis is that um, there's going to be something between patients who are, who are MRD negative and something between MRD positive patients. There's going to be some kind of flow cytometry signatures that's going to be able to tease that out. So we do the typical thing that you usually do with flow cytometry data. We transform the data using the logical. And then we thought, well, let's use some kind of threshold in step two. Um, uh, to normalize it uh, to data or do some static gating um, after normalization to see um, if there's gross differences between all the MRD positive samples and all the MRD negative samples. And then we used flow type uh, and Archaeoptimix to try and find this difference. You know, here's a bunch of samples in group one, here's a bunch of samples in group two, like we just talked about. What, is there some cell population in there that best explains that difference? And then we win. And we used the area under the curves to do that. And we found something. It was great. Um, here's some cell population that really explains well the difference between those two groups. So we thought we were done. Um, so, but the first question that the clinician had is, well, wh what is that? You, 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 they always want to see the dot plots in the end, right? So we have to go, um, well, the before we showed them the dot plots, we, we said, OK, here's uh, heat, we can do heat maps in R, like you see like for microarray analysis. And we see here's these populations that are very highly uh, different in terms of proportions between MRD negative and MRD positive. So we're feeling pretty good at that. But you want to see those populations. And so you've seen today how you can make these kind of plots um, in R. And we showed you you can do the gating hierarchy, as you've seen with flow density, and walk through and see, OK, here, in a typical sample here, um, lots of cells, uh, or not so many cells, and the other 
other case, more cells. And we can show all the patients who are in one group and show all the patients in the other group. And again and again and again, you see this difference. So we're feeling good about it. The, the Archaeoptimix tree, where that big p-value is then shown, the gating actually kind of makes sense. And this is always a good thing to check because um, sometimes stuff doesn't work. And you really want to do a lot of visualization and exploratory data analysis to make sure that the things, the, the lines that you're seeing in R and Bioconductor, where it spits out a p-value, or it spits out some marker, or it spits out something, you, you want to get some a check on that by doing a completely separate kind of analysis to try and get to that same point to validate um, with one method by another method, method that you haven't done something wrong. And it's a really good idea to see if you can get to the same endpoint using multiple different ways. So the first way we, we try to get that endpoint was using Archaeoptimix and Flow, uh, our Flow type and Archaeoptimix to find a cell population that was highly significant. Okay, we found that using that tool. Now can we use gating or some other tool, we try to use manual gating, automated manual gating, to get to that same population and sort of visualize by eye that there's this big difference in the proportions between these two groups. And it seemed to be the case. Then um, maybe look at p-values, look at the proportions um, in one group versus the proportions in the other. Um, looked a lot different, um, feeling really good. Um, this is uh, again, using that manual gating flow density type of tech, automating the manual gating hierarchy uh, kind of technique. But the problem was, we're, we're ready to go show um, Andrew Wang, our clinician, with that. And then, okay, we found something. He looks at that cell population, and we've had this problem several different times is, I don't know what that is. I can't make a story. There's, there's no biology about this cell population. And this is one of the problems that we're... C3 negative, CDI positive. Yeah. What the fuck is that? What? I don't know, but it's it's highly significant. It's reproducible. It's something. It's something. So the cool thing. So the cool is it's either good news or bad news at this point. It's like, wow, this is nobody's ever found this before. Why is that? Well, don't, don't, so we can we, yeah. So, But it's it's real. We, we went through all. We can see it in all the patients. There, there's actually there's actually population. There's some dots. That are, so what's okay? So here we come back to the problem. What's what's what does it mean to be a population? Is one fundamental question we've kind of teased around a lot. We can we can see a bunch of dots that are separated from another bunch of dots, <coughs> and that that's all the computer can do. Then you as a biologist have to decide: is is that a population? And then the problem is, can I put a label on that that people can understand in terms of biology? Because we have this very strict hierarchy of cells that start from T cells, B cells, and K cells. What we know, Mary Roderer published a very interesting paper, um, I guess maybe four or five years ago, that the more markers you put on a sample, the more cell populations you're going to find. It's kind of intuitive. But there's a lot of stuff out there in your blood, it seems, and we may not know all of that. It doesn't help us in this case because we're not going to be able to get a paper in blood because we don't know what that is. Or, so, so, now, so, so, now, so maybe it's the gorilla walking across. May, it's a, yeah, maybe it, is, maybe it is. So, but you're kind of stuck at this point, right? So, and this is the problem. This is one of the problems with automated analysis: is how do you publish something? that isn't traditional, that you can't say, you haven't followed the strict hierarchy of manual gating that everybody understands. And we run into this more times than I would like. And it's, it's a bit of a pain in the ass. Um, so we've got to find something else. And so um, we used another tool from another lab. That's nothing wrong with that. Um, we decided maybe we can use Spade. And um, one of the problems with Spade that we ran into is you get a, you get a different um, minimal spanning tree every time you run it. It becomes very, it can become difficult to compare lots of different samples. And so one way you can get around that is you build up a flow cytometry file that's representative of all of one group based on sampling. So you take a um, like we, pooled frame. Pooled frame. Thank you. So now you know how to develop, write a pooled frame. So you can make a pooled frame of all your MRD positive samples. We made a pooled frame of all MRD negative samples. And use that spanning tree to build up other spanning trees from each representative of MRD positive and negative. 
And the cool thing was, so this is our pooled sample, and we built um, uh, MRD negative samples um, based on the normal tissue. So this is the normal tissue. All the MRD negatives kind of look the same. Um, and then yeah, if you really want to, you have to go down and actually figure out what kind of cell populations these are. But we, we looked through all the samples uh, that were normal from the normal tissue, MRD, or sorry, all our MRD negative and all the MRD positive looked kind of the same in normal tissue, which is kind of what you expect. Normal tissue looks like normal tissue in terms of MRD positive and MRD negative. What is normal tissue? We basically gated out the non-tumor part of the sample from the flow cytometry data file. Then um, we looked at the tumor part of the flow cytometry data file. And um, what we found is um, all the uh, samples look different in tumor tissue. And so what that told us was, even though we found something that seemed to be a signature when we did the RP optimix, it said these, this one population is statistically different between the two populations, and it's in there. Grossly, there seems to be very high heterogeneity in tumor tissue in MRD patients. So even though we can find one little thing, there's lots and lots of differences, but um, nothing really significant that's inherited among all the MRD positive versus MRD negative. And so it's really hard to find that one signal. But um, SPADE, which we haven't talked about today, is a really great way to do this big overview of all your samples at once. And we can see that um, all the samples look different. So this is kind of a win for us. Sorry, sorry, you do. This different spanning tree uh, modes. It is, uh, this, this is the arch, and then there's another one called like it's a, it's a different tree shape. It's a Kawai, K A W A I. That I don't know. Sorry. It's a layout, different layout. Different layout. Um, oh, is that the how they do the rooted? If it's rooted or not rooted? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. This is a, it's like a whole necklace shape. And the other one is like a tree shape. Yeah, like yeah. It, I mean, it looks like there's a straight, there's a line across, right? The, yeah. It's the straight the necklace, I guess. Um, the last, so, so annotation is important. Visualization is hard and tricky. And, and sometimes you have to think of different ways to visualize your data. And that, that can be really hard. And um, something for you guys now that you're all experts in R to code up new methods that will help us all out. Um, the third problem is ease of use. So it's easy, easier for you guys now to use R than it was, um, but we're not really at the stage where we're um, with Flojo where you can just point and click stuff. And that, that's a real problem. For, that's why we have to have this workshop. But you're, now, now there's, I think, maybe 200% more people using R than there was for, bio, for flow cytometry research than there was two days ago in the world. <laughs> It's, it's a really rare talent that you guys have. Um, there's not that many people doing this. It, it, hmm? Yeah. Certified. You're actually the first certified people ever to do this. Yeah. Because um, I, can, I can really count on fingers and toes how many people in the world are doing competition analysis of flow your data. There's not that You saw the people doing flow cap. And most of those are developing the tools. They're not actually using them for any real purpose, um, except in one-off kind of studies. But we, you're obviously here, so you see the need. But it's not easy. Um, aside from R, R is a really good way, and one of the reasons why you're seeing all these tools in R, it's a really good way to get something up and running quickly. It's a really good way to prototype that something's working, because it has all this infrastructure in there of statistics and math that you can test things out and do a lot of stats math development of programs without a lot of hammering around all this basic stuff, which is why you're seeing all these tools developed in there, because they have this basic infrastructure. It's not really user friendly in terms of normal biologists. Um, but one thing we can do is if you develop some tool, you can put that in a user friendly fashion through something called Gene Pattern that was developed at the Broad MIT and Harvard. Widely used for microarray analysis, proteomics, and other kinds of tools. It has about 10,000 users worldwide. You can make these big pipelines, like I've shown you a couple of times, that step through data analysis. And, and basically, if it tells it, you can take an R package and put it into Gene Pattern in a couple of hours once you have all the code written. They have this all this infrastructure built. You just take your R code, do a couple 
ins and outs and put up on the web for everybody to use. Really fantastic. <laughs> it depends who's doing it, but it's, when, I, I've had no problem in all the ones that I've done. <laughs> it's not, it's, and then it makes it easy because now you have a point and click interface. Um, the problem is it doesn't allow you the flexibility, but it's canned now, so you don't have you don't have as much opportunity to do all the flexible kind of things that you've learned what, that sometimes you need to do uh, in analysis. But we've done some work um, to make that as easy as possible. Um, we put a lot of the tools that you use today in there um, for quality assessment, for gating and clustering. You, there are some options that we try to let you uh, drop down list on. There is some ways to put things together, um, but it's not great. But it's a good way to some people to get started on some things. One thing that I'm really excited about is a project that we're working on that's not available widely yet. Um, we're just finishing it up. It's called Open Cyto, and it's basically an R photometry, R flow infrastructure that allows you to plug in gating, but not having to remember all the parameterization and where to put the brackets and is it double brackets or single brackets or squirrely or square or two squares. And basically gets away a lot of the R coding while still making it available for you within R. And you can do things like make a gating template in Excel. Once again, um, you just say um, all. You just give it some, for example, uh, parameters for what is the thing that you're looking for, um, what the parent is, uh, what dimensions you want to look at, what method you want to use to cluster, and then maybe an option. Have that in Excel spreadsheet, and then this looks very. Uh, easy to you because now you know what R is. You basically read in your template, which is this. You say, well, this is where my data set is. Point to that. And then you just run it. And it basically uses this method to gate that data. So you don't have to remember all the parameters. So I'm excited about that. Hopefully that make it easier. Um, Flow Workspace, we didn't talk about that today. Um, but if you're using Flowjo, um, you're going to want to use this tool to look at what, you're, what you have already in Flowjo in R. It's really fantastic. It's probably going to make your job a lot easier down the road to make that interface and get back and forth between Flowjo and R. Um, we're also working, and from Flowjo today, you can also uh, call out to R and have, send stuff back and forth. Um, it's kind of, I think, only available in the Enterprise version 10, but they are working very hard the company to to work with R because they realize a lot of the tools. I don't I don't know why they're doing it. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? No, because the stuff the stuff in R is awesome, right? And if you can, but it's not an easy way to visualize. And so I think they see the value in having a tool for visualization along with a powerful R compute engine. And so they have a way to talk back and forth. And I think that's going to be a very exciting development. And now you guys can take advantage of that. Um, one of the problems that we have as well is that algorithms don't know what a T-cell is. And so you can do all this fancy gating. It's just going to spit out a bunch of amino phenotypes. Um, but we know those amino phenotypes live in some hierarchy. So starting, for example, from all lymphocytes, you have T-cells. Within the T-cell subsets, you have gamma, delta T-cells, alpha, beta T-cells, mature T-cells. Below mature T-cells, well, you can have things like regulatory T-cells. Uh, one of the things I'm working on right now is trying to get our and get these computer languages that spit out clusters to get a better understanding and making little bunny ear fingers, at least get better labels to the cell populations they're spitting out. And we should be able to interface with this ontology um, hopefully within the next couple months and we'll get more meaningful labels on the populations you're going to get from clustering. So what's next for you guys? Um, you can take more courses. Courses are fun. You can go off for a couple days. Um, so there are courses that the bioconductor people run on how to do bioconductor programming. Um, they have them in great places around the world. You can go to Spain. Um, they have them every year. Um, they're advertised on the Bioconductor website. Um, so that they will help you now that you have some understanding that it's a really fantastic thing to learn about. Um, how to get more into how to do programming in R. Because now that you know the basics, how to do for structures and loops and things like that, get more familiar with that. Uh, now that you know at least where the flow stuff lives and what they are, you want to be able to put these pieces together. There's lots of stuff on the Bioconductor website um, that complements what you've seen today. Um, there's introductions to flow cytometry. Um, there's talk. There's 
talks and slides about how to do gating and things like that. Um, suggest you to go look at those on your own time. Um, all those are freely available along with the code and the data to run them on. There's mailing lists. Um, so you can go to the Bioconductor mailing list and there's people actually do use R in real life to do flow strategy analysis. This is a can't remember this is a couple months old when I did the last search. But you know, at least 184 posts on this list. Um, do go check the post first to see if somebody's answered your question. If not, um, all I think every post has been answered by somebody who's wrote the package. So if you get stuck, um, let people know. Um, and people will be happy to answer. Even people who are answering who haven't written the packages. So I, I know there's a lot of people watching the list who are using R. Um, at least they're not publishing stuff on it yet, but it's becoming more and more. So. Um, Everyone's happy. Everyone. I, I saw some, somebody post a question on FlowQ, and somebody else was using FlowQ. I was like, oh my god, someone's actually using this package. Answer that question for them. It was, it was kind of neat to see. Uh, people want to help other people. I guess that's why we're here. Or at least I am. I don't know about Renita. Hmm? Um, so take home message. Um, hopefully that you've learned that I, re I really fundamentally believe they're at the stage now with flow spectrometry informatics that you can pour some data in and do discovery or diagnosis out. The tools we have are complete. Um, we can mine high throughput data. We can find correlations. We can find things that are being missed by manual analysis. We can get informative descript results, descriptive results. It's interoperable between different platforms. The stuff is going to take uh, time still, but it's CPU time. It's not your time, which means we can do fun stuff. Um, I like snowboarding and biking. Um, you can do some more science. Um, the stuff we have is based on statistics, um, mostly. Um, we, uh, it, there's math behind all we do in R. It's a statistical programming language. I, I, until we get stuff like where to draw that line sometimes and flow density gets a bit iffy. But um, once you tell us how to do it, we use statistics to make sure it ends up in the same spot. Like the statistics is two standard deviations or 85th percentile. That's kind of more math. Maybe. Um, it's reproducible. It can be. Most of the tools are reproducible. You get the same answer twice, not necessarily all, always, depending on what the tool is. Um, uh, for example, k-means, if you don't do some forcing, won't give you the same answer the second time exactly. Um, but at least you know what happened. You can kind of trace through, because you have all the code there, um, what went wrong. Um, garbage in, garbage out. You know, Make sure the comp if your computation is not right, everything else is going to fail down the road. If your agents are off, everything else is going to fail down the road. Um, not easy for biologists to use, but you guys are no longer biologists. You're computer scientists now. Um, and collaborate. Um, you're not alone. You now have a buddy beside you and five other, six other people, five, five other, six other people beside you um, who will now be able to answer your questions. I guess after this, um, there's going to be a open place. The meetings thing will live on forever. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, you have your video's email, and you know, yeah, and so, and we'd be happy to, Redina would be happy, I would be happy to, um, to answer questions that you guys have if you get stuck. We're, all the stuff is available, or I think you put the data set up there too, maybe, yes. Redina, yes, um, to answer your questions after you go home. You're not alone anymore. Lots of people involved. Any, and anybody uh, in the full storage community, this is one of the things I found really exciting. Um, they're all nice people. Um, anybody who's developed the package, um, Raphael and his group are really wonderful. Greg Finnack is a great resource. He's a uh, research associate in Raphael's lab. A really great guy. Um, Joseph and my group, if you have any questions about full storage, he's really good to know. Um, the Keshe's group are fantastic people. Um, they're all, everyone that I've run into really has been wonderful in their ability to be approachable and, and to help out others trying to use their tools. Um, there's not a bad one in the lot. So don't be afraid to reach out for help. And with that, Ooh. you survived. <laughs>
<laughs> so thank you to Ryan and Regina for uh, pulling it together for uh, what I think is a really great offering of a first workshop. Uh, thank you all for coming. I need surveys. There's one submitted, so I need some more. And um, everything's going to stay posted on the wiki. You have access to the wiki for uh, until next year, this time when I update the wiki. Um, everything has been recorded, and I will render those files in, uh, in July and post, get those. By September, they should be up on the web, so you can review stuff. But if you need something sooner, let me know. I can. It, it takes about half a day to render one file, so it's not a short process. But I will, I will get that up there for you. Any, if there's any questions, let me know. If yes.